Welcome, geologists, to our very first lecture of the semester. So you're going to be learning today about the insides of the Earth, its crust, a little bit about geologic principles in which geologists operate to understand and interpret the physical world around us. So take a look at this picture from Iceland. I remember taking it on site, thinking this looks like a scene out of Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. Interestingly enough, those movies were filmed in New Zealand. So you look at this spot right here, I want to point out that this landmass right here and this landmass were touching tens of millions of years ago. They aren't today because they've been separating. That's a divergent plate boundary. This kind of real steep walled profiles of this ridge here with this U-shaped valley looking feature that was created by valley glaciers. These incredible waterfalls are created by melting glaciers. All of these are features that we're going to be learning about in this course. Even the color of this rock has to do with something you'll learn about in test one. So let's talk about the earth, how it was made, its parts, because that's important for you for having this information to interpret the stuff you learn for the remainder of the semester. All right, first of all, the Earth has continually been changing over its 4.56 billion year history. We can date the Earth by looking at radioactive elements, and you'll learn more about that if you take the second half of this course in historical. Now, the Earth hasn't always been the same, and nor will it be in the future. It's in a constant state of change. So to say that the Earth is static, that it's not doing anything, is not true. It may look like it stays the same to us every day, but it's not. There are three definitive sections of the Earth, really four if you want to count uh, the inner and the outer layer of the core as two separate pieces. But there's a very important core that's the most dense part of our Earth. Then there's the mantle that is where convection and our hot spots grow. And then there's the top of the Earth called the lithosphere, known as the crust. And there's two parts of the crust. There's the oceanic and continental. We're going to look at all three. Do I expect that you're going to know these precise numbers for your test? No, but they might be some great extra credit opportunities down the line to know that information. It's more concept-based. Look at how dense the core is, and you're going to find out why in just a minute. Compare that to the crust, there's a substantial difference. That has to do with magma blending from the core to the mantle, the mantle to the crust, which produces different minerals. Minerals are all created at different temperatures and crystallize at different temperatures. Subsequently, they melt at different temperatures. So that defines what kind of rock material we can have based on blending of magma. Now, in earth science or in geology, one of the first things that we need to talk about is the fact that the earth is not consistent all the way through the inside. So let's discuss that for a minute. We can uh, calculate what type of rock or material the Earth is made of by sending seismic waves down inside the Earth. Yes, seismic waves or earthquake waves. We can simulate that. We can take a look at the travel path of P and S waves, and we'll be talking about them in just a second. But essentially, you have to imagine that you're traveling down a road, let's say Interstate I-35 and all of a sudden you veer off a little bit because you get sleepy or you hit a bumpy part of the road. You know what I'm talking about, where the ridges change, those wake you up sides of the edges of the road, and you're like, oh, it bounce, 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 bounce. Well, that bouncing process changes the way that the ride feels in your car. It's still, you're still riding in the same car, but the travel feel is different. So you have to imagine that the same thing happens to seismic waves as they travel through rock material. So some rocks are more dense than others. Some are made of completely different compositions. So the way that those seismic waves travel or ride through them, it varies. Also, the speed in which they travel varies. We can actually simulate this exact same thing in a laboratory setting to determine what the signature patterns of these two seismic waves are through any element or rock type on Earth. A place inside the Earth where composition change is referred to as a discontinuity. There are two of them inside of the Earth. 
Before we discuss what their names are, let's talk about those two seismic waves that we mentioned that help us determine that there are discontinuities inside of the Earth. The first one is a P wave called a primary wave. These are always the first to arrive on the scene. They're the fastest traveling seismic wave, and most importantly, they travel through solids, liquids, and gases. The fact that they can travel through fluids and gases is what makes them so different from secondary waves, which can only travel through solids. So let's say that P and S waves are traveling through the Earth from the same earthquake or simulated earthquake. P waves hit liquid, specifically the outer core, they will continue to travel through the outer core while the S wave hits that liquid and it bounces back off. That's how we know that the inside of the Earth has different compositions is by looking at the signature patterns of P and S waves. So a P wave might slow down as it travels through the first discontinuity, which is this light white line right here called the Mohovric or Moho for short. If it reaches the core, the outer core boundary to the mantle, which is a different discontinuity called the Gutenberg, it's going to have a different signature pattern as well. So let's start with the discontinuity closest to where we live. The Mohovric or Moho discontinuity is the boundary between the crust and the upper mantle. It is the defining section in which we know composition changes from the base of the oceanic and continental crust to the top of the uh, mantle. All of those pieces put together, the top of the mantle and the two crustal pieces, are referred to as the lithosphere. So that red line that you see right here represents the MOHO discontinuity. So P and S waves have a different signature pattern and even slow down as they go through this composition layer right here which tells us that the material that oceanic crust and continental crust are made of is different than what is at the MOHO, and certainly what's beneath the MOHO. So that's important because our crustal thickness is not the same all over the world, and that means the MOHO may be at different locations and thicknesses are distances beneath our feet. For example, where you have mountain ranges in the centers of continents, that's going to be your thickest areas and the edges of continents are very thin. The thinnest crust we have is actually in the ocean basins, and that's also one of the reasons that when we're trying to drill to find the MOHO discontinuity, most of that occurs out in the ocean. So you might wonder why would anybody really care about drilling down there besides just plain old good-fashioned uh, bragging rights. Let's just think about what could be at this red line right here. Maybe new minerals, new metals and ores very important economic and intrinsic value is that's the primary reason of why people around the globe are trying to get down to the Mahovric discontinuity. So let's look at the second discontinuity called the Gutenberg. These, by the way, both of these are named after the people who discovered them, their last names. All right, so the Gutenberg discontinuity is the boundary between the liquid outer core and the base of the, uh, the rock uh, rigid material at the base of the mantle. That exists about 2,900 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. So that's important because it's this boundary right here where Gutenberg discovered that S waves bounce off and P waves continue to travel through the Earth's interior. So think about the importance of what I mentioned earlier. P waves travel through solids, liquids, and gases. S waves only travel through solids. So if S waves deflect off here because they can't hit or travel through liquids, that means this must be made out of a liquid material. Now I realize Hollywood's made a movie that says that we've made it all the way to the core. That has not happened scientifically. However, we can determine the interior parts of the Earth based on the signature patterns of P and S waves. So S waves completely disappear in this layer, but P waves continue to travel even through the interior core, which is solid. So let's talk about the core. Some of your test-related questions will be about the percentages of each piece of the Earth, meaning the core, the mantle, and the uh, crust up here. And the core, the combined inner and outer core, makes up 16% of the Earth's mass. While that may not sound like a lot, it's probably the most important 16% of the 100% for this reason. The relationship between the inner and the outer core 
is what gives us a magnetic field. So the inner core is solid, the outer core is liquid. The outer core spins around that solid inner core creating magnetism. Magnetism, our Earth's magnetic field, is what protects us from solar wind from outer space. It is so vitally important to holding in our atmosphere and creating a gravitational field. So without the Earth's core, we don't have those features that are critical to protecting us from outer space. Also, it is what drives convection currents that happen in the mantle. So the heat that's fueled from this stuff in here actually comes from the decay of radioactive elements that are in the core. So if you've under, ever wondered why is our planet active, it's because it has what's called a dynamo core. Dynamo means that it has an inner core that's solid, an outer core that's liquid, and it creates that magnetism. Another planet that used to have this was Mars. Not all planets do, uh, but we do, and that's so we have a dynamo Earth. And that's a very important element when you're looking at the overall picture of plate tectonics. So the inner versus the outer core. I don't expect you're going to know the distances for where these things start and finish. It's more per, for your information only. But I am interested in you understanding that the inner and the outer core are different in composition and they're different in their texture. So this one's solid, the inner core, made up of predominantly iron and nickel with a few trace elements of other lighter elements. And then you get the outer core, which is liquid, still predominantly made out of iron and nickel, but with a little bit of uh, other elements, higher percentage of other elements, that will escape into the mantle. And the mantle's the next piece we'll look at after we finish the core. All right, so the mantle, this is where all the action happens in geology. And then we get the expression of that action and the lithosphere, which is the crust. This is 83% of the Earth's mass. That's just a, an incredibly huge percentage. There are multiple pieces to the mantle. Here is that Gutenberg discontinuity right here between the liquid um, core, outer core, and then our base of our mantle down here, the lower mantle, the upper mantle. And then there's the lithosphere, which is part of the mantle, which is the adjacent part to the crust. It's in this section right in here where most of the action happens, right here. So let's talk about the asthenosphere, the lower mantle, the upper mantle, and talk about each piece and how they're vividly and critically important to the overall performance of plate tectonics. All right, the lower mantle. First of all, it makes up a majority of the volume of the Earth's uh, mantle, just so you know. And it's made out of very, very ultra mafic material. Like, what does that mean? You're going to learn about that. So hang tight until we get to igneous. But in a long story made short, ultra mafic is stuff that's really, really, really high in iron, magnesium, very low in silica minerals. And because of that, it's extremely dense. So the lower mantle is close to the composition of the core as any other part of the Earth could be. Having said that, this lower mantle also has some other elements like aluminum, silica, oxygen, which is important to creating blending of magma. So peridiotite is the rock that this is very, very rich in, and that's an ultramafic intrusive rock that you'll be able to identify soon when we get to igneous. The asthenosphere sits directly on top of the lower mantle. And by the way, the lower mantle is a rigid rock material. The asthenosphere is not like that. It's more plastic Play-Doh-like. So it's not liquid, because remember, the S uh, waves from an earthquake can travel through the asthenosphere, but, and so can P waves for that matter. But nevertheless, if it was a liquid material of hot spots in the asthenosphere, then the S waves would never be able to travel through it instead of it slow flowing rock. So if you've ever seen a lava lamp, that would be a good example of what's happening in the asthenosphere. These rocks are, are, slight, are very much heated up, but they're slightly flowing. And so they are constantly in a state of moving. So they've been partially melted, not fully melted. So they're still a semi-solid, allowing for both P and S waves to travel through them. So what will happen is you get a magma plume that develops starting usually from the lower mantle, working its way up in the asthenosphere. You get a, a big magma plume, and then these hot spots will work their way up to 
the lithosphere and the crust and begin to create volcanism. So that's how we create volcanoes in the ocean. That's how we create volcanoes on land in both cases. Now the top part of the mantle also is combined with what we call oceanic and continental crust and they're separated by that boundary known as the moho. You just learned about that. The lithosphere is the solid upper portion of the mantle. It's very rigid and uh, this allows for all of this material, both the upper part of the mantle and the continental and oceanic crust to float on top of the asthenosphere. Floating is really kind of the uh, word that you'll read about in books, but I don't like that word necessarily because it makes you go back to the asthenosphere thinking it's liquid. I would like you to think about it as a big giant bowl of jelly or uh, Play-Doh that's kind of plastic-like. That's what the lithosphere sits on top of, so it's constantly shifting its position on top of that asthenosphere. Because of the asthenosphere having convection, hot spots work their way up and begin to cook the lithosphere, which allows for plates to crack and plates to move apart, plates to slam together, and plates to slide against each other, which is the foundation of what we call plate tectonics, which we'll be getting to soon. So I mentioned just a minute ago that the asthenosphere sends hot spots up and cracks up the lithosphere. This is the end result of what that looks like, or should I say the current end result. In geologic paths, some of these plates weren't here, other plates were present. Some of those have been uh, removed from the earth and we'll learn about how in plate tectonics and new ones are born as old ones are taken away. But don't judge a plate simply based on its proximity to land or if it's in the ocean, if it's an oceanic or continental plate. We define oceanic and continental based on the types of mineral composition that makes up those plates. For example, the Nazca plate is an oceanic plate. The South American is a continental plate. Their composition is radically different, especially when you look at the amount of magnesium and iron that these ocean plates have, which I might link to our plate tectonics that that's what causes oceanic plates like the Nazca plate to sink underneath the lighter plate and weight known as the South American plate. The same would be true here in Juan de Fuca to North America. The same would be true to Philippine to Eurasian. So wherever you have an oceanic plate that's more dense than a continental plate simply because of its composition, interesting geologic relationships form. Now let's get to the upper lithosphere. This includes continental and oceanic crust. You would recognize this as 100% of what you know on Earth because that's where you walk every single day. Now, both parts of these lithosphere are both very different based on the three things you're gonna need to know for testing purposes, their thickness, their composition, and their age. So the lithosphere only makes up 1% of the overall mass of the Earth. So remember that the core was 16, 16 plus 83 leaves 1% remaining for the crust, and the 83% was the mantle. So let's look at the two different types of crust and how very different they are. Continental crust is between 20 and 90 kilometers thick. The thickest crust that you'll find on the globe would be those under mountain ranges like uh, Mount Everest, where the Himalayas are. Most of continental rock is made up of very felsic material, Felsic refers to high concentrations of silica and aluminum. Now down here at the continental crust, at the base where it touches, the, uh, this would be the Mahovric discontinuity right here, it's going to be more mafic-like, which is darker. Mafic would look more like this right here. So as continental crust is developed, it's going to end up having more silica minerals up here and less down here. That's a blending process that happens in the formation of crust at volcanoes and hot spots. Now, continental crust is less dense than oceanic crust. Now, continental crust is extremely old. The oldest stuff that we have on continents is a little older than 3.8 billion years old. There's some people who think they've found rocks as old as 4 billion, but I can tell you on every continent we have stuff that's at least 3.5 billion years old. So that's important to note because that means we're not losing continental crust nearly as fast as we are oceanic crust. What's up with that, right? So we're going to find that out shortly in plate tectonics. Now oceanic crust. 
Different ball game from Continental. Very, very thin in comparison to Continental. It is only 5 to 10 kilometers thick, so it's the thinnest crust we have on Earth. It's also the baby of the family. It's up to 180 million, not billion, million years old. And the oldest stuff is that continental crust sitting adjacent to continents like on the east coast of North America or United States. Very, very dark uh, iron rich material lacking in silica. Now it's not that it doesn't have silica, it's just low percentages of silica. So this stuff's going to be very, very dense. This stuff is going to be very lightweight. Now you'll pick up oceanic rock and continental rock. You'll be like, okay, they feel the same. Well, they really don't. If you measure their density, this one's going to be more dense than that if you had equal size material. So one of the key things to know about oceanic crust, it's very thin, it's very young, and it's very, very low in silica. So it makes mafic rocks like basalt and gabbro. So when you take a look at the relationship of the Earth's parts, everything's changing based on how these plates are moving. So in plate tectonics, you're going to learn what kind of boundary this is, plate boundary. You're going to realize what kind of plate boundary this is. You're going to understand what this kind of plate boundary is. All of the plate relationships determine the type of geologic phenomena that occur where you and I live. So more to come on that as you learn about the different uh, types of plate boundaries on the planet. So I would like to take a break at this point. Before you go, I'd like you just to think for a minute about what you've learned thus far about the Earth's parts and realize that this is the mantle producing crustal change right here by heating it up and separating it, pushing that away from its spreading center, and then causing an ocean plate to smash into a continental plate. Look at the volcanoes that are forming along the coastline and then think about the United States and think about where that might create that scenario today. When we come back, we'll be learning about geologic principles and how they are used by geologists like yourself to interpret the world around us. I'll see you back in a few minutes. Bye.